Hello and welcome. My name is Alan and we are back with more news and politics for the day. This is for December the 20th, 2023, Wednesdays. Trying to think of the day of the week to say I knew what day it was, but I couldn't remember what the name was. Anyway. We're starting out here with a, an article from The Lever. Larry Fink's Big Climate Lie. Coverage of the BlackRock CEO offers an object lesson on how to not report on greenwashing. In early December, Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, the world's largest investment company, announced BlackRock was going all in on cryptocurrencies, helping revitalize interest in the dwindling fossil fuel heavy industry. This otherwise routine business story is noteworthy for one important reason. Three years ago, Fink was heralded by many business media for ostensibly helping to put uh, usher in a new green and sustainable brand of capitalism. Fink is now going all in on the fossil intensive crypto industry in, and it is a good time to review that fawning press coverage and determine what lessons we have learned from that particularly cynical news cycle of greenwashing. For his big announcement in early 2020 uh, that BlackRock was pivoting to climate friendly investments, Fink received extensive positive media coverage representing himself as a private industry advocate working to combat climate change. With 10 trillion in assets under his management, roughly equivalent to the aggregate wealth of Latin America and twice that of Africa, Fink argued that BlackRock could be a force of positive change for society's most urgent problem human cause climate change. He received friendly coverage in the New York Times, NBC, CNBC, Bloomberg, and Fortune, all portraying Fink and BlackRock's work as a colossal cultural shift in corporate America away from the myopic profit motive into something resembling responsible corporate stewardship of the earth. His motives, to be fair, were never presented as entirely altruistic. Climate risk is investment risk, he wrote in his 2020 company investor letter. But he did make the case, one echoed by many media outlets that curbing climate chaos could be a source of potential corporate profit. Fink's green brand stand turned out to be entirely bogus. By January 2022, Fink was adamantly rejecting woke capitalism Weeks later, BlackRock announced it would support fewer resolutions on climate change, telling investors we do not consider them to be consistent with our clients' long-term financial interests. So yeah, corporate greed wins out, as always. Here's a story from ProPublica. Once you're no good to them, they get rid of you. Immigrant workers are essential to Wisconsin's dairy industry, 
but when they get injured, they're often cast aside. The dairy farm worker said he was fired and thrown out of the house where he lived after he told his boss his hands were frostbitten from working outside in below zero weather. Another said it took his supervisors nearly an hour to call an ambulance after he was crushed by a metal gate and left lying on a manure-covered barn floor. A third worker said her boss blamed her and refused to pay her medical bills after she was trampled and thrown over a fence by a bull. And yet another said his supervisor told him not to go to the emergency room after he tore open his finger when he fell trying to catch a runaway calf. He was told to call the veterinarian instead. These are some of the stories immigrant workers will tell you about getting hurt on Wisconsin dairy farms and what happened afterward. Yeah. One of the biggest things is there's often this outcry of, oh, they're coming here to take our jobs. Uh, no, they're coming here to work jobs that often most normal Americans won't purposely go into because they don't want to deal with this kind of BS and crap and expect to get paid a decent wage. And so you have immigrant workers treated as subhuman because they know they're illegal and thus they can threaten them. Well, I can just turn you in and have you sent back. It's, yeah, it's bullshit. Most of the cause of immigrant immigration into this country is because the rich, the corporations, they don't want to pay a decent wage. It's such bullshit. Yet, this is the, the facts. It's not, oh, I want to come here and, and live a posh lifestyle. No. Uh, anyway, here's another doc, uh, part of article by ProPublica A Delicate Matter Clarence Thomas private complaints about money sparked fears he would resign. In 2000 Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas pressed Florida Representative Cliff Cliff Stearns to raise the justices' salaries. And yet, knowing what we know about Clarence Thomas and other Supreme Court justices, yeah, maybe they have had should have had their goddamn salaries fucking cut instead of raised. In early January 2000, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas was at a five-star beach resort in Sea Island, Georgia, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. After almost a decade on the court, Thomas had grown frustrated with his financial situation, according to his friends. He had recently started raising his young grandnephew, and Thomas's wife was soliciting advice on how to handle the new expenses. 
the month before the G justice had borrowed $267,000 from a friend to buy a high-end RV. Don't buy the goddamn RV, bitch! The fuck? At the resort, Thomas gave a speech at an off-the-record conservative conference. He found himself seated next to Republican member of Congress on the flight home. The two men talked and the lawmaker left the conversation worried that Thomas might resign. Uh, sounds like the bitch needs to fucking resign. Oh, I can't afford this high-end RV. You take out a $267,000 loan to buy a high-end RV, and yet people complain when an average... American wants to get a snack and something to drink. You know, they, they kept complaining, avocado toast, which I guarantee you, not as many people are eating that as you fucking think. It's goddamn bullshit. And yet, this right-wing court justice is like, I can't afford this high-end RV! <laughs> Bitch! Then don't get it! God damn! Congress should give Supreme Court justices a pay raise, Thomas told him. If lawmakers don't act, didn't act, one or more justices will leave soon. Maybe in the past year or next year. At the time, Thomas's salary was $173,600. Equivalent to over 300000 a day. But he was one of the least wealthy members of the court. And on multiple occasions in that period, he pushed for ways to make more money. In other private conversations, Thomas repeatedly talked about removing a ban on justices giving paid speeches. Yeah, see, this goddamn cuck, Clarence Thomas, he's one of the biggest examples of goddamn corruption and bullshit. An equivalency of $300,000 for a salary. You know how many goddamn people would love to make that and yet this bitch is like I, I feel I should be allowed to make more money uh, you know cause I want to be able to buy more expensive things cause I'm a little bitch uh. fuck Clarence Thomas Thomas's efforts were described in records from the time obtained from ProPublica, including a confidential memo to Chief Justice William Rehnquist from a top judiciary official seeking guidance on what he termed a delicate matter. Bitch! Oh, God damn! The more I hear of Thomas, the more I hate this fuck. God damn. I hate these right wing cucked pieces of garbage. God damn it. Anyway. Here we have a daguerreotype of 8th U.S. President Martin Van Buren. 1782 to 1862 is when he lived. 
the daguerreotype itself was from 1849. But yeah, one of the earliest pictures, real life pictures of a president. Before there were cameras, yeah, one of the ways to have images produced was through daguerreotype. Yeah, Martin Van Buren, eighth president of the United States. Let's see. I think he was right after Andrew Jackson. But yeah. After leaving office, he joined up with the Know Nothings, which was a party trying to form on its own, but yeah. Uh, this is a new image of the Christmas tree cluster with data from NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. So, yeah. I mean, you can see why it's called the Christmas tree cluster. It's almost a triangular tree shape. It's green, so yeah. The way the stars look from inside or behind it give it the appearance of a string of Christmas tree lights. That's pretty cool. I like that. All right. From the BBC, South Korea, students sue after Thomas N, or teacher ends, Exam 90 seconds early. I'm still angry about Clarence Thomas. Uh, yeah, teacher ends the exam 90 seconds early, a minute and a half. Tells you how seriously they take their time. Says, I need this time. <laughs> a group of South Korean students are suing the government because their college admission ex exam ended 90 seconds earlier than scheduled. They are asking for 30 million won, equivalent to $15,400 or 12,000 pounds each, the cost of a year studying to retake the exam. The error affected the rest of the student's exam, their lawyers say. The country's infamous college admission test, known as the Sunung, is an eight-hour marathon with back-to-back -back papers in multiple subjects. Can you imagine an eight-hour exam? I've had some exams that are several hours, but eight hours, goodness. The Sunung is one of the hardest exams in the world, and stakes are very high. It not only determines university placements and jobs, but even future relationships. A number of measures to help students concentrate are taken during the unusual event, such as closing the country's airspace oh, and delaying the opening of the stock market. So yeah, this is how seriously it's taken in South Korea. Oh, goodness. The results of this year's exams were released on the 8th of December. <sighs> the law 
lawsuit filed on Tuesday by at least 39 students claimed that the bell rang earlier at a test site in the capital Seoul during Korean, the first subject of the exam. So yeah, I'd say it would be something similar to uh, English as the first part of the exam. But yeah, I've, I've had some long exams, several hours. You would do the first part in a period of time. Then you would go to the next, uh, have a break for a little bit. Then go to the next part for a period of time. But yeah, uh, whoo, an eight hour exam. I think when I took exams like that, it was three or four parts, maybe five. But yeah, you're looking at usually they were giving about 45 minutes each. So yeah. Um, like I said, it was a few hours, but I can't imagine an eight hour. Oh goodness. Anyway. From France 24. Netanyahu rules out Gaza ceasefire until elimination of Hamas. Hey, fucker! Their leaders are in Qatar. What you've been doing is genocide. And that you're saying, yeah, I want to continue the genocide. Fuck you, BB. God damn, I hate that fuck. From Rolling Stone, Trump acknowledges Hitler comparisons and doubles down anyway. They're destroying the blood of our country. It was one of the more notable ones he recently said, yeah. Donald Trump accused immigrants of destroying the blood of our country during a campaign rally in Iowa Tuesday, repeating hateful rhetoric echoing white supremacist and genocidal Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler. They're destroying the blood of our country. That's what they're doing. They're destroying our country. They don't like it when I said that. And I never read Mein Kampf, said Trump, referencing Hitler's manifesto. They could be healthy. They could be very unhealthy. They could be... They could bring in disease that's going to catch on in our country. But they do bring in crime. <laughs> but they have them coming from all over the world, the former president continued, and they're destroying the blood of our country. They're destroying the fabric of our country. Ah, uh, shit fuck! A little lesson on history. This country was born on immigrants! A huge portion of the U.S. was birthed from immigration, dumb dick. He is such a lying dickhead, a con man. And people, they gobble that shit up. I'm like, really? Really? Why? You would have never 
accepted this from someone else. But, oh, let Trump say, oh, such good shit, let me eat that. It's like, the fuck is wrong with you dumbasses? Yeah. Uh, and finally, from Barron's, Iran hangs a child bride for murder of husband, according to a rights group. Iran on Wednesday hanged a woman convicted of murdering her husband, whom she married while, s they're still, while she was still a child, defying an international campaign for clement, uh, clemency, rights groups said. Samira Sabz Sabzian, who had been in prison for the past decade, was executed at dawn in Gezel Hesar prison in the Tehran satellite city of Karaj, the Norway-based Iran human groups, right, human rights group said. Her execution comes as concern grows over the number of people this year executed by Iran, where hundreds of people have been hanged mainly on drugs and murder charges uh, including more than a dozen women. Uh, Sabzian was a child bride who had married her husband at the age of 15 and had been a victim of domestic violence, according to relatives. The Hengar Rats group also confirmed the execution of the woman, now believed to be in her late 20s or early 30s, saying that she was originally from the city of Karamabad in the western Loristan province. Amnesty International said it was horrified by the reports of the chilling execution, saying the mother of two was subjected to a forced and early marriage as a child. <sighs> it's why I think children shouldn't marry because often they don't have the um, what is that word maturity to enter into such a relationship you know and to be fair I think you don't know who you fully are. You may have indications and clues. You may even know who you aren't. But necessarily knowing who you are fully, I don't think they're even at that point. Because you're still learning things about yourself. So, yeah. But, we'll go ahead and end this episode there. As always, thank you for watching. Educate thyself. Think, read, study, learn. Someone tells you something you have trouble 
believing, ask them to cite their sources. I'll be putting these links in the description box below the video. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all in the next one. Until then, later.